Good morning and welcome to Frankly Speaking here on WYDC-TV Big Fox. I am your host, Frank Aikum, and we are broadcasting from the Hesselson Studio here on Marcus Street in Corning. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you so much for all the comments that I've been receiving. You see the number on the bottom of your screen. You can always uh, reach out to me there. We're going to get to those in just a moment. First, I forgot to mention this yesterday. Congratulations to Waverly, our friends in Waverly, holding off Fonda Fultonville for the Class C football state title. So congratulations to all of our friends in Waverly. Uh, that's 46 to 26 victory over Fonda Fultonville at the JMA Wireless Dome. Must have been an exciting experience for Waverly. Okay, so we received a lot of messages these last few days, so let's go through all of them. First up, Democrats fixed things to such a certain extent that Biden isn't on the New Hampshire primary. They are adding candidates to primary ballots in other states. How anyone can't say Democrats fix elections isn't possible. Next one. Oh, and this you may recall, I believe it was on Friday that uh, I responded. And it was about the safety in New York and, and the real concern that we have for theft, um, young people getting involved in crimes, knowing that they're not going to get in any trouble. The list goes on and on. And, uh, and I did say. Uh, that I do believe our local politicians, the Assemblyman Phil Palmasano, Assemblyman Chris Friend, uh, State Senator Tom O'Meara, that they are outspoken on it. But the problem is, in New York, there is a supermajority of Democrats having the House, or excuse me, having the Assembly, uh, having the Senate, and having uh, the Governor's Mansion. So, this person responded back, this viewer, and thank you again. Again, the number on the bottom of your screen. Thank you for your lengthy feedback this morning on Frankly Speaking. And don't get me wrong, I greatly appreciate Phil Palmasano, Joe Sempolinski, Sheriff Allard, and others, you, meaning me, thank you, who have spoken on behalf of the community on these issues. But I guess what I meant is, it seems just empty words with no action plan on how we can right the ship. But while I try to remain optimistic that positive change can occur, I've never felt so disheartened because clearly time is not on our side with open borders and unknowns. We have big problems, and they're here. They're in our community across the states. Thanks again for all that you do. Well, thank you for that comment. And I know it does empty words. Um, I, again, it, they're trying. There are action plans. But, again, the governor does not seem to be interested in public safety, only from a political standpoint, where she'll kind of mislead at press conferences, suggesting that she's done more than she has. There is a reason why Lee Zeldin did so well against her. It was because he was running on public safety. And unfortunately, and we've talked about this so much, people are making a game plan, and that is they're voting by moving to other areas, by their feet. Um, and that's why we see the population decrease. And the problem with that is they're not... Uh, cutting back spending in Albany. So those of us that stay are forced to continue to pay uh, for these this misguided legislation. And again, I, I hate to say it, but how many times has someone come up to you and said, I can't do it anymore? In three years, so that was one of the polls we had recently. What was that? A lot of New Yorkers have five-year plans of, of how they're going to move out eventually. Or you have people that just finally say enough is enough. And public safety is uh, one of the things, if not the number one on that list of reasons, to move out. It's also, of course, high taxes, uh, unfriendly business climate, uh, least amount of freedom in all 50 states. Okay, the next comment that we received. Senators have written Biden to stop travel from China again. The unknown respiratory virus spreading is just another prequel to our federal election year. Every four years, there's another pandemic released, yet nothing is still done about it. Well, to that point, we talked about this um, well, quite a bit last week, and I believe a little bit yesterday. Forget about triple-demic, which is what they're calling it. The U.S. is headed for a syndemic this, this winter, and experts warn we're not prepared. COVID will likely reach levels in December not yet seen this year. Combining with surges of, of the flu, RSV, and other pathogens for a winter not so different from last year's triple-demic, experts say. Now, it's a term he prefers to triple-demic, which is syndemic, and that's um, an assistant dean of research and associate professor at the New York Institute of Technology, uh, Raj Rajananyan, uh, saying that he prefers syndemic as it acknowledges the impact of more than three pathogens on the healthcare system and the need for policies to address the phenomenon in addition to medical interventions. Strained hospitals, this is an exact quote, strained hospital capacities, 
workforce ex exhaustion, burnout, a lack of effective therapeutic tools, poor communications, a lack of compliance with COVID precautions, a lack of continu uh, continuity, uh, excuse me, continuity planning, excuse me, and the pervasive influence of social determinations of health only make the nation's delicate health infrastructure more fragile, he said. <laughs> We're seeing more and more of those articles. And of course, uh, China is saying, no, nothing, nothing to see here. Um, don't mention, don't mention this in the media. Uh, we will probably get away from that topic. I have a few things here about George Santos, who we didn't really talk that much about. And I don't want to focus a lot on it, but a couple of interesting things. Also, we've got a few things about Joe Biden, Nikki Haley, of course, um, all that and much more. So let me take my first break before we get going uh, and get running too late. So we'll be right back with Frankly Speaking here on WYDC TV. Big Fox, stay with us. <laughs> Overlooking beautiful Marcus Street here in Corning. We're broadcasting from the Hesselson studio. This is Frankly Speaking. I'm your host, Frank Acom. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, yesterday, I mentioned on the program, excuse me, uh, that we have coming up on December 15th, I want you to mark your calendar, uh, a sort of telethon, a way to, to thank the folks at the Salvation Army of Corning who do so much for our community. I know it's called the Salvation Army of Corning, but it's much bigger than that. I think of it as really the Salvation Army of Steuben County. Well, we're going to have a little bit of a telethon here with some special guests and a lot of fun, some music. That's coming up on December the 15th uh, from 6 to 8 a.m. Don't miss it. Um, we'll have opportunities for you which you can donate. You can stop by the studio. We're, we'll have a kettle out front. Uh, we're going to have a lot of special guests, so do not miss that. And I'm going to be promoting it a lot as we near December the 15th. Also, thank you again to everybody who would reach out, making comments uh, about the stories that we're bringing up. You see the number on the bottom of your screen. You can call at any time, leave a voicemail or text message as preferred. Uh, and you can also email me at frank at WYDCTV.com, frank at WYDCTV.com. I do not want to talk a lot about George Santos, but there's a couple of pieces here that are, are somewhat interesting that I wanted to pass along to you, maybe give you a different look at the <laughs> Santos saga, because he is now um, kind of sharpening the knives, if you will. He, he's going to uh, tell all, and of course you expect there to be some kind of um, pomp and circumstance with him them really making a big deal on his way out. But he said, why would I want to stay here to, and again, I know kids listen, to heck with this place. By Friday evening, he was tweeting about his colleagues. He wrote on X, formerly Twitter, that he would file an ethics complaint against three fellow Republicans from New York, Mike Lawler, Nicole Malatakis, and Nick Lalota, who had been the three to push for his ouster from Congress. He offered no proof of wrongdoing against any of the three, though. He also wrote that he would file a complaint against the representative Rob Menendez's Rob Menendez, whose father, the New Jersey Senator Bob Menendez, has been criminally charged with acting as an unregistered foreign agent on behalf of Egypt. But again, he gave no specifics or no details of why he would file this ethics complaint. And as you may or may not be aware, anybody any person can file a complaint with the Office of Congressional Ethics, but that does not mean it will result in an investigation. But he's been really, um, well, he's threatened a, a, a bunch of congressmen, former colleagues. Let's talk about hypocrisy, he said. Can someone ask Nicole Malatakis stock tips? Oh, he, he, he spelled her name, Mala Stock Tips, when she became a savant in stock trading. She said the practice reek of insider trading, much like Paul Pelosi. Before joining the committee, the congresswoman didn't have an active trading habit or a high volume stake. The question is, what set of information is she trading with? He then pivoted to Mr. Lawler, accusing the lawmaker of using a company he owns, a stake in called Checkmate Strategies, to pay for, quote, services related to his campaign. The concerning questions are, is Mr. Lawler engaging in laundering, laundering money from his campaign to his firm, then into his own pocket, I will let the Office of Congressional Ethics be the judge of that. Now, there's also to add on top of this, and this comes as no surprise, this actually was um, in the works before he was uh, forced out. HBO is working on a film about George Santos's life, specifically about the campaign, him winning, and then, of course, uh, now his ouster. It's based on a book called The Fabulist, the lying, hustling, grifting, stealing, and very American legend of George Santos. 
This was pub uh, published back in November. The film, now in development, is described as a forensic and darkly comic look at the crazy, unprecedented congressional race on Long Island that led to Santos being elected to Congress. It comes from Frank Rich, who executive produced HBO's Emmy-winning Washington, D.C. satire Veep, as well as the network's Emmy-winning drama, drama Secession. So the New York Post, and specifically Miranda Devine from the Post, has a sort of different take on this saga, saying that Republicans suckered into expelling George Santos and the most conservative vote, voting record in New York, which is kind of an interesting way to look at it. He was a consistent Republican vote, so maybe there could have been the discussion with Republicans to not oust him. Now, I will say, when it comes to booting him out, I don't necessarily like the president. Obviously, we don't like the guy. Obviously, he's lied about so many things. But I still think you have to have your day in court before this happens. I do think, you know, you, you basically told the people that voted for him uh, that that doesn't matter. Uh, they get the final say in Washington. Uh, you don't have to approve of George Santos, which we don't. To understand it should have been left to the constituents in Long Island and Queens to decide on his uh, suitability to remain in Congress. Nevertheless, despite a slim majority in the House and a crucial votes looming as they head into an election year, 105 Republicans were suckered by moral vanity into expelling one of their own last Friday. Um, just what the Republicans need as well to add on top of this insult injury is someone who's willing to turn more friendly fire on Republicans. And that's what George Santos has threatened to do. Who knows who will fill his place in the Democrat district he miraculously flipped last year. Governor Hochul has to hold a special election in the next couple of months. And you can bet the Democrats will use all they can to regain a seat that they used to take for granted. So she's saying wasn't necessarily from a political standpoint the right move. Maybe out of moral standpoint it was, but not necessarily uh, the right move when you're thinking of strategy and the slim majority that we have. Very interesting. Finally, ABC News asks, GOP had New Yorkers lead way in expelling Santos. Will it help them keep the majority? Oof, I don't know. Um, look, House Republicans knew a lot about George Santos before he was elected. And we have reason to believe either intentionally kept that information out of the public domain or willfully turned a blind eye. And then when the information exploded into the public domain, continue to coddle George Santos and play footsie with him for the better part of the year. That's what Democrat leader Hakeem Jeffrey said. You know, I think I have a different take on that. I believe it was fellow Republicans that released that information about him, about all of his lies, because otherwise, if the Democrats had had this, why wouldn't they have used it before the election? But if you recall, all this information started coming out after he had won. So I actually do think it was the Republicans that were, were turning on him from the beginning that wanted him out from day one. Just kind of interesting. So there's enough on that. I just wanted to bring a couple different takes on George Santos to you. What do you think? Good thing, bad thing? Weigh in. And I will read your comments on tomorrow's program. We've got to take another short break. Stay with us. This is Frankly Speaking here on WYDC-TV. Big Fox. We'll be right back. We are back, frankly speaking, here on WYDC TV, Big Fox. I'm your host, Frank Acup. Thank you so much for joining us. This came out the other day. We're going to switch to local here for just a moment. And I meant to bring this to you. Um, we kind of kept you updated on this, but it, uh, it's been a while. This is a joint statement of Steuben County and Deputies Association of the County of Steuben. They finally have reached an agreement. Steuben County and the Deputies Association of the County of Steuben are pleased to announce the finalization of a multi-year contract for our sworn law enforcement officers. With unanimous support from the county legislature and a successful vote of the association, this contract will cover the year of 2021 to 2024, providing these staff members with both fair, retroactive pay increases and competitive salaries for the coming year. Quote, the Deputies Association of the County of Steuben would like to thank county administration for sitting down with us to find a resolution for fair and competitive salaries. This is Association President Matthew Sorge. We would also like to thank the county legislature for the unanimous vote for the approval of these fair and competitive wages. It was through the support of the community and continuous lines of communications that we are able to reach this deal. Now, Steuben County Manager Jack Wheeler, friend of Frankly Speaking, 
said, while negotiations can at times become contentious, and we saw that play out in the media, the county legislature and administration have maintained its desire to find an amicable and equitable resolution to this process. We are very appreciative of the hard work and collaboration of the leadership of the Deputies Association and maintain great respect for the dedication of our law enforcement officers. We are one team in Steuben County government and look forward to continuing our partnership with the Deputies Association and its members. So there is an update from a story that we've been bringing to you for quite some time now on the program. And I want to get that quickly before we go back to national news. And there's quite a few things here uh, about the Biden administration, about the presidential race, the media, as I've said time and time again, pushing Nikki Haley as kind of the alternative to former President Trump, uh, propping, not propping her up, that sounds negative, building her up. Uh, and that is, again, the case coming from CNN. Now, this is why I find it interesting. CNN, could be said, would never want a Republican winning the presidency ever again. Yet they're telling us who Republicans should vote for for president. According to Harry Enton at CNN, Nikki Haley has a plausible path to the Republican nomination. We've entered the home stretch in the lead up to the 2024 Republican presidential primary. And while Donald Trump continues to lead every major survey of the race, Nikki Haley seems to have at least gained some momentum to be his chief primary rival. And we brought to you, was it yesterday? That Democrats are actually donating heavily to Nikki Haley in hopes that she ultimately defeats uh, former President Trump, which is kind of interesting. And, and that's sort of a red flag in and of itself. But does Haley have a real chance to win the nomination? History shows us she has a plausible roadmap. And then they start with the bad news, and the bad news is the polls. She's still polling at about 10% nationally, and that's the person that they're saying is making such headway. It's just very interesting uh, because it is so different. Now, some would argue that if everybody were to drop out and it was just Nikki Haley versus Trump, maybe her numbers would be... Uh, improved that those numbers would go up but as of right now she's 10 percent nationally while trump topped 60 percent in many surveys not only is she 50 points behind the former president ron DeSantis is in between them polling at about 15 percent and that's something else the media has been doing a lot lately saying DeSantis has no chance at 15 percent but nikki haley has a viable path forward at 10 percent um again i like nikki haley and i've said this numerous times on the program it just raises concerns when people that never want to see Republicans win tell us what Republican needs to be chosen. Uh, we saw it with Jeb Bush. Remember, she, he's the only way that we can beat Hillary Clinton. Of course, uh, that did not matter in the long run because he couldn't beat Trump. But before that, it was McCain. It was, uh, it was uh, Mitt Romney. The only way is these moderate, more moderate Republicans. Then they get uh, destroyed in the general election. So according to Harry Enton, the bottom line is there is a pathway for Haley, though it's a long and tough one. She will need to mount a lot of comebacks. There's a reason no one has successfully traversed that pathway before. All right, let's take another short break. Stay with us. This is Frankly Speaking here on WYDC-TV. Big Fox will be right back. Welcome back to Frankly Speaking here on WYDC-TV, Big Fox. I am your host, Frank Hakem. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. On the program, as always, you can reach out to me. You see the number on the bottom of your screen, 607-358-3131. I would love to hear from you. What do you think about Nikki Haley? Does she have what it takes? She's, uh, I don't know if embracing is the right word, but she's calling it a badge of honor that she has uh, this nickname that they've given her, the, meaning the GOP, calling her bird brain. She said, look at these guys. They know that they're surging, that I'm surging the polls. So they're all starting to hit. Okay. Now Trump has begun deriding her as bird brain over recent months. And at one point, his campaign even sent bird cages to her hotel room in Iowa back in October. Uh, the nickname, said Nikki Haley. He's losing it. It's not even a funny nickname. I don't even think it was that great. But you look at everything else he says. He knows how, raw, how strong I was when it came to China. I was actually tougher on China than he was. But not even that funny. I, I will say, I didn't like the... The sanctimonious one. Oh, that much is a little bit too much for Ron DeSantis. 
uh, bird brain, kind of, I would say, typical. I don't think any real surprises, but she's wearing it as a badge of honor, saying that this signals to her that she's uh, surging and someone to be concerned about. Uh, we're going to jump around a lot. The show's going quickly. I know we're almost... Uh, we're almost out of time already because uh, I'm running a little bit late. I've been going on these tangents, but we've got a few things here uh, just in general that are a little bit different, not necessarily anything very specific. We'll probably talk about uh, Israel here in a little bit. There is a piece that hopefully we can get to. If not, uh, you can find it at New York Post by John Strassel. Strassel, excuse me. Uh, surprise. Capitalism makes people happier and more giving. We'll talk about that when we come back. Maybe that. A couple of other things as well. Stay with us. This is Frankly Speaking on WYDC-TV. Big Fox will be right back. Beautiful Marcus Street in Cording, where we broadcast from the Hesselson Studio. I'm your host, Frank Akam. This is Frankly Speaking on WYDC-TV. Big Fox, thank you so much for joining us. So John Stossel says, surprise, Capitalism makes people happier and more giving. You must be lonely, says Stossel. The media says loneliness is everywhere in America. A Los Angeles Times columnist says there's a mass loneliness crisis going on. Capitalism is making you lonely, says Jacobin Magazine. Vox claims capitalism makes us feel empty inside. As usual, the media are just wrong. Again, this coming from John Stossel from the New York Post. There is no empirical data that actually shows that we feel more lonely now than we did in the past, said historian Jonah Norberg. When researchers compare people with previous generations at the same stage of life, they don't find evidence of increased loneliness, but more people live alone now. I would think that would make people lonelier. What they never tell you in the reports is that people who live alone and spend less time surrounded by other people are also more happy with those that are in relationships. It's a complete opposite of what people expect, Norberg says. In less market-based societies, 20 to 40% say they have no one to count on if they need help. In the richest and most individualist societies, it's the low single digits. Feudalism, communism, fascism, that's divisive. All are based on getting resources by taking them from somebody else. Capitalism forces us to think, what does the other guy want? The most important aspect of capitalism is cooperation. That's why every time you buy something, you hear this double thank you. It's tr yet true, yet kind of odd. When I pay both the salesperson, I usually say thank you. It's because I got the product I wanted, they get my money. I want the product more than the money. They want my money more than whatever they are selling. We both feel that we've won. But research, they have now done this test all over the world, and to their surprise, they discover people are most generous in capitalist societies. In fact, on average, they offer twice as much as those in the least capitalist societies. The closer people live to marketplaces, the more generous they are. If they constantly buy and sell and negotiate, they begin to take other people's interest into consideration. That's what markets do. They do affect our character, but not in the way that the critics say. They don't make us more divisive and aggressive. They make us more generous. Capitalism is good in many ways, says John Stossel. He's the author, by the way, of Give Me a Break, How I Exposed Hucksters, Cheats, and Scam Artists and Became the Scourge of the Liberal Media. All right, that was just something a little bit different that I wanted to pass along to you. Maybe something you're not hearing uh, elsewhere. What do you think? Is there a loneliness crisis? Um, the president of a climate uh, summit, COP28, COP28, claims that fossil fuel ban could, quote, take the world back to clay uh, to caves excuse me he says that there's no science behind scrapping fossil fuel saying the move could take the world back to caves now what was instantly said this is scary it's denierism now that's a climate denial uh, they use that because much like i've talked about in the presidential race where they say they don't have to give former president trump a platform so they're not going to show his rallies they don't want to have the town halls they don't want to have the debate they use that same type of censorship when it comes to people that maybe disagree with what the media's narrative is. And in this case, it's Sultan Al Jabir, the president of, of COP28. He has claimed there is no science indicating that a phase out of fossil fuels is needed to restrict, uh, restrict global heat to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Al Jabir also said a phase out, <clears throat> pardon me, of fossil fuels would not allow sustainable development unless you want to take the world back to caves. The comments were, quote, incredibly concerning and verging on climate denial, scientists said, and they were at odds with the position of the UN 
Secretary General Antonio Guterres. Excuse me. So, just uh, something. I don't bring it up to, well, whatever you think about that, what he had to say. I just think it's interesting that that's one of the ways that they are now censoring by saying, well, climate denial. We don't have to give him the quote-unquote platform. We don't have to give him um, a voice. And this is one of the first times I noticed, uh, not this specific, but it was climate change. It was one of the first times I noticed where the media was um, very willing to tell you that they were censoring. Uh, they were not hiding it where they said, we do not have to give a platform, we do not have to give a microphone, we do not have to give airtime to people that we disagree with on climate change. And they saw that that worked, and now they're doing the same thing with presidential candidates that they don't like, or Republicans that they disagree with. So I wanted to pass that along to you. We've got a lot more to talk about. I know we're jumping all around this morning, but that's what the kind of fun you get here on Frankly Speaking. So stay with us. We'll be right back. <laughs> Thank you again for joining us here on Frankly Speaking on WYDC TV, Big Fox. I am your host, Frank Akam. Uh, John Kirby, the White House National Security Council spokesman, blamed Hamas for breaking the ceasefire. Quote, we know they are holding more women and children. This was on Fox News Sunday. I meant to bring this to you uh, yesterday, but we just don't have perfect visibility. We are, we're at this literally by the hour. And we want to get that ceasefire put back into place so that again, more hostages can come out. Hamas is the reason the pause ended because they refused to put on the list additional women and children that we know that they are holding and they're refusing to let go. We are working literally by the hour to see if we can get this back on track. Now, uh, Representative uh, Jayapal was slammed by both Democrats and Republicans for her uh, discussion uh, on Israel. Now, this, of course, uh, she's one of the members of the squad, which we're going to get to in just a moment with AOC, perhaps. But she called for balanced criticism of the Israel-Hamas war when asked about progressives' alleged silence over Hamas's rape of Israeli women. Dana Bash on CNN asked her about the horrific sexual assaults and why there hasn't been a lot of conversation about that. She said, I think we are, uh, we always talk about the impact of war on women in particular. I've condemned what Hamas has done. I've condemned the actions, absolutely, the rape, of course. Morally, I think we cannot say that one war crime deserves another. That is not what international humanitarian law says, Jay Paul said. With respect, this is Dana Bash, with respect, I was just asking you about the women and you turned it back to Israel. I'm asking you about Hamas. She said, I already answered your question, Dana. I said it's horrific, and I think that rape is horrific. Sexual assault is horrific. I think that it happens in war situations. Terrorist organizations like Hamas obviously are using these as tools. However, now listen to this. However, I think we have to be balanced about bringing in the outrages against Palestine. Um... Yeah, a lot of people went after. Even uh, Christine Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi's daughter, who some have speculated that she may run for office, by the way. But I should not say, I should not have to say this in 2023, but here we are. Rape is rape. Do not minimize, excuse, balance, or both sides sexual assault. That is victim blaming. We have spent decades trying to undo that in the laws, the courts, and the hearts and minds of the people. So that's Nancy Pelosi's daughter. So a lot of criticism coming from both sides. The squad has not handled this very well. We're going to talk to you a little bit here uh, about AOC because there's a new book out about, um, about the squad. But I don't want to change up topics quite yet uh, from Israel. The New York Post editorial board said that Joe Biden's fecklessness may bring defeat for Israel and Ukraine. Whether it's diplomacy or high strategy, the Biden administration's um, knows no bounds. It's oblivion, oblivion in the I can't, I can struggle with that word. Um, anyway, I don't think you have the credit for that, said Secretary of State Anthony Blinken. The entire Israeli society is unlimited behind the goal of dismantling Hamas, even if it takes months. Meaning the Biden administration won't stand by Jerusalem for a protracted fight and we've seen this that the more and more weakness there's a piece just the other day about um, muslim voters uh, saying that they're going to work against biden so that he's been trying to i don't know if you want to say walk on eggshells his policy has or his stance i should say has weakened recently blinken also offered up a list of impossible demands quote the massive loss of civilian life and displacement of the scale we saw in northern gaza must not be repeated in the south israel must clearly and precisely 
designate civilian safe zones and avoid enduring internal displacement. Now, we don't actually know how massive civilian losses have been. Hamas cites deaths over 10,000, but it counts its own casualties in that figure. Yes, civilian suffering is vast. There's a, law, there's a war on. Most Gazans have fled the north, despite Hamas shooting at them when they flee, and will have to flee to the safe zones Israel's already designated in the south as the IDF moves in. Uh, so this, this is quite a lengthy piece. You can find it for yourself, <clears throat> pardon me, at the New York Post. But Blinken admits the overriding truth. Quote, Hamas cannot remain in control of Gaza. But he's made it clear President Biden won't give the Israelis the credit needed to take too long to do it, even though taking more time would help keep civilian deaths down. Call it catch-22 diplomacy. Meanwhile, Team Biden's strategic decision to barely respond to attacks on U.S. forces across the Mideast is now paying off for Iran and its axis of resistance. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in just a second, but Iran has ordered up what Biden fears most, escalation. Biden sees the right side in these conflicts, but all the rest of his instincts serve the bad guy's interests. And when we come back, we'll talk about a piece from The Post as well by Mark Dubowitz and Richard Goldberg called President Biden must face reality. It's time to act versus Iran. We'll be right back after this. Stay with us. I'm Frankly Speaking. Broadcasting from historic Marcus Street in the Hesselson studio. I'm your host, Frank Akum, and this is Frankly Speaking on Big Fox. So as I mentioned, Mark Dubowitz and Richard Goldberg wrote a piece at the New York Post. President Biden must face reality. It's time to act versus Iran. President Biden must face reality. The Ayatollah in Iran is attacking Americans and American allies without fear. Biden so far has responded with American mush. But Ali Khamenei won't back down until he runs into American steel. So it's kind of an interesting point, one that we have not seen taken too many uh, instances by the media, but one that has to be addressed or at least uh, looked at. Whatever Biden does next, he must internalize one simple truth. Tehran will keep attacking Americans and U.S. allies unless and until he flashes American steel. Now, Mark Dubowitz is chief executive of the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, where Richard Goldberg is a senior advisor. Both are sanctioned by Iran. All right. A couple other things I mentioned um, in the last segment, that there's a new book out about the squad. It's called The Squad, AOC and the Hope of a Political Revolution. And I guess she has become somewhat of a pariah among Democrats in Congress, and that she even clashed with Nancy Pelosi. And we've talked about this a little bit in the past, but she definitely thinks it's uh, her way is the right way <laughs> at all times. Uh, while somebody like Obama wants to be seen as being all things to all people, Ocasio-Cortez actually thinks she can be all things to all people while leading a political revolution, says the author, Ryan Grimm. In July of 2018, the month after AOC beat Crowley in the Democrat primary, she met with then House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi, who urged the 28-year-old lefty to drop the slogan, Abolish ICE. Pelosi believed the phrase, targeting U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, had been injected into political discourse by the Russians, according to Grimm. He writes, AOC wondered, this is how the leader of the party thinks. So it kind of goes back and forth. And she didn't realize at first that she did have to give in to what... Uh, Nancy Pelosi demands as just the nature of it. And, and I think since then, she has done pretty good at that. Um, she is now the vice ranking member on the House Oversight Committee, widely regarded as one of the most powerful panels in the lower chamber. Ocasio-Cortez declined to challenge Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer or Kirsten Gillibrand in a primary. Still, Grimm concluded that AOC, though outspoken in public, was crippled by being too conflict averse. The constant sense that she's failed at something and she lets it get in her head. She really takes that stuff, we'll say, to heart. Kind of interesting. So the new book, The Squad, AOC and the Hope of a Political Revolution is out now. Let's take one more short break, and then we're going to wrap things up here on Frankly Speaking. Moving fast this morning. Stay with us. Welcome back to Frankly Speaking here on WYDC-TV Big Fox. I'm your host, Frank Akum. We're wrapping things up on this edition of Frankly Speaking. Boy, it went fast, didn't it? 
Uh, we got a few minutes uh, left together. I do want to remind you, I know I mentioned it earlier, but coming up on December 15th, we have a very uh, exciting broadcast. It's going to be two hours from 6 to 8 a.m. And it's all going to be to raise money, fundraise, for the Salvation Army, kind of like a telethon. Uh, we'll have a kettle out front. We'll also have ways that you can uh, donate uh, via text or online. So that's coming up on the 15th, but we're gonna have a lot of special guests and a lot of music and just uh, a fun time. We'll dress up a little bit here. Who knows who will pop in. So make sure that you mark your calendar for uh, again, December 15th, coming right up. Think of it as kind of a Christmas special, the frankly speaking Christmas special, if you will. And we're doing it all for an amazing cause, which is the Salvation Army of Corning. But think of the Salvation Army of Corning as all of Stu Ben, really. Um, they do an amazing job. I'm proud to be on their board. Actually, the chairman of the board um, at the Salvation Army of Corning. When you start to see the numbers, and we'll bring them to you, of how many families and how many kids and how many people in general that they help serve throughout the year, it's, it's really going to... Uh, touch your heart and really make you think about the, the great work that they do. So we're going to breeze through a couple things here. First of all, uh, Representative Comer predicts that more moderate Republicans will back the impeachment probe. He said his idea is, or his theory is, that some of these people that have seemed a little squishy, that maybe didn't want to be uh, backing the impeachment probe, uh, went home for Thanksgiving and they went to Walmart. They went to the grocery store and uh, got an earful from their constituents about what they believe. Comer, who is chairing the impeachment probe, mused that 15 or 20 moderates within his caucus have been stonewalling efforts to make the inquiry official due to fear of the media. A great thing happened during Thanksgiving. The members went home and they met people in Walmart, people on Main Street. They heard from their constituents. Yes, we want to move forward. We want you to move forward. So we are unified at a time where I think there's no secret our conference is broken in a lot of ways. Well, that is a little bit of an understatement going back to that point that I think it was Miranda Devine was making. That's another thing that we don't need with the George Santos uh, decision. By booting him out, he now is uh, shooting friendly fire, as they put it in that piece. So I don't know. That'll be interesting to see if those 15 to 20 moderates will uh, will change their mind after that Thanksgiving break, if that's uh, wishful thinking on Comer's part or if that is actually the case. Also, there is a lengthy, lengthy piece here that I wanted to mention. Uh, we're not going to get to all of it, but uh, Charles Kretz went to President Biden's hometown, uh, Scranton, to talk about Bidenomics. And it seems like, like much of the rest of the country, Bidenomics not uh, extremely popular. As you go to the grocery store, you go to the gas station, um, you can call them whatever you want, but people are not happy. Now, that's why they spent, well, I think it was $25 million. Numbers don't always stick with me that great, but a $25 million ad buy uh, in swing states to convince people that, no, never mind what's happening to you at the grocery store, at the gas station. Uh, Bidenomics is really successful. Um, in November 13th, Biden, on November 13th, Biden tweeted that uh, he doesn't look at the economy through the eyes of Wall Street and Park Avenue. I look at it, though, through the eyes of people I grew up with in Scranton, Pennsylvania or Claymont, Delaware. Um, when asked if he has a preferred, uh, when he, they went around and started asking people in Scranton, the one guy said his preferred, and this is all anecdotal, but his preferred candidate is Trump. The economy stinks. I mean, everything's going up except paychecks. I just think the economy stinks ever since Biden got it, said Jones. That's his name. When he was asked who he prefers in 2024, Jones also indicated support for the GOP frontrunner, meaning Trump. Local resident Kevin told Fox News Digital he is disillusioned with most of the political class. I don't think any of them see through the eyes of the people. I think all of them see it through the eyes of Washington. The economy has gotten worse. He said, I'm a registered Democrat, but I am not happy. That's Kevin. Oh, and I, did I say this was New York Post? I meant to say, if I did, I, I, I aired. It's actually Fox News. A uh, sign popularized by the office um, sits on display there in Scranton because that's where Scranton was. While many residents had their oft-critical opinions, local leaders made their own feelings known in a pair of controversial roadway renamings. Local media at the time captured photos of PennDOT replacing BGS signs on Interstate 81 at its split with the erstwhile Central Scranton Expressway just over a year ago. A unanimous city council vote in 2021 changed the name to the President Biden Expressway and the downtown artery, the highway that uh, becomes Spruce Street, was renamed Biden Street. 
that led some local business owners to uh, to complain about having to re-register their addresses and the costs associated with that process. That's a very good point. Jason from nearby Moscow, Pennsylvania, was not a fan of the renaming and ripped the president's recent posting. He said Biden's tweet was not accurate, that he doesn't see the economy, period. He has no idea what's going on. It's an absolute mess. He's abandoned Scranton when he was four years old. So the fact he keeps using Scranton is hysterical. I've heard a lot of PA residents say that, um, not just those living in Scranton, that it is interesting, you know, that that shows his roots. That he's a common guy, working class. But, yeah, he abandoned, as this uh, actual resident of Pennsylvania said, he abandoned them when they were four. So the fact that he keeps using it... Um, kind of kind of interesting uh jason's comment echoes the sentiment of former president donald trump in a 2020 campaign stop near his opponent's home trump declared biden abandoned pennsylvania he abandoned scranton when his family moved to delaware <laughs> speaking in nearby old forge during a trip that includes stops at the borough's famed pizzeria trump said he was here in scranton for a short time and didn't even know it <laughs> he's not a scrantonian said local resident nelly um I've been here my whole life, she said. So uh, this is a, like I said, kind of a lengthy piece uh, coming from Fox News. Uh, but as Biden's hometown reveals how it really feels about Bidenomics, and even some in the Democrat Party have said, you've got to change that. You can't keep pushing Bidenomics. If nothing else, people don't like the name of it. Uh, but to highlight what some have deemed to be a, a big weakness for him, but bragging it up, meaning the economy, maybe not the best idea. And, you know, they'll tell us, things like well never mind uh, what you're seeing that's what that ad buy was all about never mind what you're seeing never mind what you're experiencing never mind what your family's experiencing um, the economy is actually good i don't know i think that's a tough sell because all it takes is a visit to the grocery store the gas station and people say wait a minute i don't care what that ad uh, was telling me uh, that it may not be <laughs> as good as they want us to believe but that's kind of typical washington speak never mind never mind what you're experiencing trust us okay um we're just about out of time wow as always the show went very very quickly um i think we covered oh i did want to mention this i know i mentioned this the other day uh but i wanted to highlight for you because this will be right around the corner i know it's uh, early december but on december 20th our friends in thurston who we've had a lot of conversations with about the sludge um the phase two water test results are in and they're gonna uh share that information at a full town hall on Wednesday, December 20th at 6 p.m. at the Thurston Town Hall. That's 7578 County Route 333 in Campbell. Uh, this will include Phase 1, which was in April, and Phase 2, September, October, and results from all 83 PFAs tests, certified and uncertified. So again, that's coming up on December the 20th at 6 p.m. at the Thurston Town Hall. I know I started the program with this, uh, but don't forget... On December the 15th, we're going to have our Christmas show where uh, we are hoping to fundraise for the Salvation Army. So uh, make sure that you uh, tune in that day if you want to get in the holiday spirit because that's really what it's going to be about. We're going to have music, performers, who knows some of the guests that will pop in the studio. Uh, I will, I, I'm probably going to leave it up to a surprise. I'm probably not going to give you a lot of <laughs> information about that. But speaking of the Salvation Army of Corning, um, it's not too late. The... Uh, 2023 Christmas. They're currently taking applications for food and toys. It's Tuesday through Friday, 9 a.m. till 12 p.m. and 1.30 till 4 p.m. Call ahead for an appointment, 962-4681. Uh, requirements, parent or legal guardian only. Must provide a photo ID for applicant, proof of address, proof of all household income, ID for all children, 0 to 13 years old, Bring two toy selections, clothing and shoe sizes per child, though no item, this is important, no item is guaranteed. So again, Tuesday through Friday, 9 a.m. till noon and 1.30 till 4. All right, that does it for us today. Again, thank you to everybody who reached out to make those comments. We'll read uh, your comments on tomorrow's program. You see uh, the number on the bottom of your screen. Please feel free at any time to reach out. You can do it after the program, during the program. It does not matter. Uh, and I will try to read those on the program tomorrow if we have the opportunity. So again, have a great day, everyone. This is Ben, frankly speaking, here on WYDC-TV. Big Fox, have a great day.